Not all people like to work, but everyone likes to play. As sports help people live happily, they help to keep people healthy and feeling good. When people are playing games, they move a lot. This is good for their health. Having fun with their friends makes them happy. So all over the world, men and women, boys and girls, enjoy sports. Since long ago, adults and children have called their friends together to spend hours, even days, playing games. Sports usually take a variety of forms: organized competitions, which draw huge crowds to cheer their favorite team to victory; athletic games played for recreation anywhere sufficient space is found; and hunting and fishing. Most sports are seasonal. So that what is happening in sports depends on the time of the year. As sports change with the season, people often do not play the same games in winter as in summer. If you want to know what others' favourite sports are, first of all, you should find where they live. Generally speaking, people in hot areas are fond of swimming, while people in cold places love skiing or skating. In this case. Surfing is believed to be an important sport in Hawaii. The Pacific Ocean sends huge waves up on the beaches, waves that are just right for surfing. Some sports, including wrestling, boxing, horse racing, etc., are called spectator sports, as the number of spectators greatly exceeds the number of players in the game. Other sports are called participant sports. Drawing a crowd of onlookers only on special occasions, such as tournaments. Some sports are commercial and professional, with players who are paid for their participation, and with audiences who pay admission to watch. Two. Nobody likes cold weather, but for old people, it can be particularly uncomfortable and dangerous. They can become cold without even noticing it. To keep warm, they may need help from friends and neighbors like you. To find out how we can help, we've invited a representative from the social service department at the town hall to talk about the winter warmth code campaign. Mr. Hastings, can I first ask you why it is so important to keep an eye on elderly people during cold weather such as we've been having lately? Yes, there are two main reasons. First. The old suffer from the cold more than the rest of us. They're not as active or strong as you and me, and it's harder for them to keep warm. This can lead to all sorts of complications. They have less resistance to infection. The quality of their lives is badly affected, and in extreme cases, they may need to be hospitalized. According to the newspapers, old people are actually dying of the cold. Is this true? I'm afraid it is. I said before there were two main reasons why we should keep an eye on old people. Well, the other major problem is that so many pensioners cannot afford to heat their homes properly. They may already be living in difficult circumstances. Then, in an exceptionally cold winter such as this one, they may just not have enough money to pay for the extra heating necessary. It seems terrible that in a society such as ours, this should be happening. It is, and what the Winter Warmth Code campaign aims to do is to bring this problem to the attention not only of the government but of everybody else in society. We all have a duty towards our old people to make sure that they do not suffer in this cold weather. So now to the practical side of things. What can we do to help? Well, we all know someone old, a relative maybe, a neighbor, someone living round the corner. We should adopt that person and make sure that we spare a few minutes every day to check that everything is okay. Make sure, even if the old person is not actually ill, that he or she is not suffering. Check when you go inside that the house or flat doesn't feel cold to you. 
it's a good idea to try to feel some part of their body, like their face or hands. Old people can become cold without even noticing it, you know. Okay, and if a person is too poor to afford to heat the house or flat? The best thing then is for the old person to live in one room only and to make sure that that one room is warm. Check that the bed is on an inside wall. Move it yourself if necessary. Check the room for drafts. A lot of cold air gets into the room through old windows or badly fitting doors. Is food important? Yes. Make sure that the old person is eating well. You could help by cooking for them or doing the shopping. Remember, a good hot meal a day makes a big difference. Also, make sure that they are well dressed. Old people need to wear more layers of clothes than we do, particularly at night. One last question, Mr. Hastings. Is there nothing the state can do to help? Oh, yes, indeed. Contact your town hall to find out about local organizations already involved in this kind of work. If there is a local Meals on Wheels service, for instance, you could get your adopted old person on the list. Then, of course, there are also many state benefits which an old person could be entitled to, and which he or she doesn't know about, and which therefore he or she is not claiming. An extra problem here is that it can often be complicated, and old people don't like going to Social Security offices to fill in forms and all that. You can help by finding out for them what possibilities exist for claiming a little extra money from the government, then applying for it for them. That little extra could make all the difference. Yes, indeed. Well, Mr. Hastings, thank you for coming in and talking to us today. Thank you. 3. The police are continuing their investigations and, based on new leads, expect to make an early arrest. The drought in northern THR continues to worsen, with tens of thousands of hectares of once lush pastoral land having now been without a single drop of rain for over eleven months. Farmers from the stricken region are beginning to despair, with meteorologists predicting that the drought is unlikely to break before Christmas. Many farmers have begun shooting their worst affected cattle and in some cases, entire flocks of sheep have been destroyed. These measures, tough and cruel though they may seem, are essential to prevent a possible outbreak of widespread disease. It is not only farm animals that are in trouble. Environmentalists are also concerned that the lack of water in rivers, lakes and streams will mean more native animals in the bush will die, unless rain comes soon. They believe the drought could have a lasting effect on the populations of such native animals as kangaroos, wallabies and koalas. Our reporter, Colin Harrison, is in Vance, talking with long-range weather forecaster Joseph Singer. Over to you, Colin. Joseph, can you give any indication as to when we might receive some rain in the affected regions of THR? Well, it's hard to say, of course, but I'm confident that the drought will break within approximately two months. If you look back at the data kept of previous periods of drought over the last hundred years or so, you see a cyclic pattern of severity developing, and we're now at the short end of the last cycle. I'm fairly certain that we'll see some rain either just before or just after Christmas. Let's hope so. Thank you, Joseph. Colin Harrison from the very hot and dry town of Vance in northern THR. Meanwhile, at the CSIRO laboratories in Ottawa... Encouraging developments have recently been made in the process of cloud seeding, a process by which clouds can be forced to make rain, and research scientists are to begin conducting trials of a new technique involving lasers later this month. If successful, 
The state government will be asked to contribute up to $5 million to establish permanent cloud seeding stations in areas most likely to be affected by drought in the future. For many farmers, though, any breakthrough will have come too late. Every week, more farming families are being forced to sell their homes, unable to survive financially with little or no income to support them. A special assistance fund has been set up to help drought-stricken families. If you would like to send some money, you can do so by calling this number now. 001-43-8172 I'll repeat that number. 001-43-8172 4 does your work bring you into contact with many overseas students, Samantha? Occasionally. As you know, a solicitor's work is to advise people about their rights when they have any problems understanding how the law operates. They may need help because of injury to themselves or their property, if they've been attacked or robbed, for example. But these are not by any means the main problems I deal with. Really? We know more about crime, I suppose, because we read about it in the newspaper or see it on TV. What other things do people come to you for help with? There are lots of things which don't get nearly so much attention. Sometimes it's to do with relationships in the community, as when bills aren't paid or contracted work isn't completed or neighbours disagree. At other times... Is to do with people not understanding the law and their responsibilities, and this is probably where overseas students have the most difficulty. One interesting example is customs laws, something which every new arrival has to come up against. What is it that overseas students find most difficult to understand about Australian customs regulations? I think it's a shock to many people arriving here for the first time to find out how many things are prohibited. Everyday food items, for example. I mean, when I've been travelling overseas, I've been quite amazed at the lack of concern in some countries about food being brought in from other parts of the world without any check. You mean people arriving into other countries don't have to declare any foodstuffs at all? In some countries, there are lots of warnings about drugs and firearms, and there are usually limits on alcohol and tobacco, and perhaps perfume. But food's not mentioned. Yes, I suppose I never thought about it till I came here. Y you can take anything you like into England as far as food is concerned. You see, here... You can't even drive from one state to another with a few apples and oranges for the journey. There are signs to remind you not to bring any fruit into some states, though they don't usually search your bags unless there's a fruit fly epidemic or something. <laughs> with those kinds of regulations between states, it's no wonder that they're so strict about what you can bring in from overseas. Of course, farmers would be wiped out if some pests were introduced which destroyed their whole crop. It's easy to understand why you should take steps to prevent that. And with food being such an important part of many cultures, it can be difficult for some people to realise they're not allowed to bring in delicacies from home for friends and relatives here. I'm defending someone at the moment who has exactly that problem. Oh, uh, what happened? It's an interesting case. Have you got time for a cup of coffee? I'll tell you about it if you like. That'd be great. Five. Hi, Jenny. What are you doing down here? Oh, hello, Steve. Well, I'm trying to fill in this form, but I'm having a bit of a struggle as I sprained my wrist playing tennis yesterday. Don't worry. I'll do it for you. Let's have your pen. Right, fire away. Mm, let's see. I want to do the drama and theatre studies. I'd like to get the certificate. The course number is uh, 60201. No, sorry, 202. 
It seems to be on Thursday at 7.30. Yes, well, we don't have to put all that down. Now, I suppose we can call you Miss. Don't be funny. And spell my name right. Hmm. Well, if you'll have a name like Jenny McPherson... Let's see. It's M-A-C. No. Big M, small c, no A. Right. M-C-P-H-E-R-S-O-N. Yes, OK. And don't forget it's a capital P, Macpherson. Now, what's your address? Well, I've just moved, so it's 6 Westway Avenue, Longford. Hang on, don't go so fast. 6 Westway Avenue, where? Longford. What's next? Your phone number, daytime and evening. Well, I've only got one, as we can't have calls at school in the daytime, so put down the evening one. 605-4829. 4829, OK. And you're a teacher. How old are you? 29? Mmm, wish I were. No, 32. Do they want my date of birth? No, don't seem to. Just age. Uh, how about educational qualifications? Well, I've got a degree in English literature and a diploma in media studies. Media studies, right. Now, have you ever done any of these extramural courses before? No, don't think so. Although I did do something on psychodrama once. But no, it wasn't extramural, was it? That seems to be it, except for the fee. Yes, well, that's the same for all the central courses. I think £25. I suppose I have to include it with this form. <laughs> Looks like it. Uh, do you want me to write the cheque out for you? But uh, you'll have to sign it. Six. There has been an armed robbery this morning at the Halifax Building Society's branch in Edward Street. John Brings is at the scene with Detective Sergeant Henry Lawson. Detective Sergeant, can you tell us what you know about the robbery? Yes, the raid took place this morning, shortly after 11.30, when a man accompanied by a woman went into the offices of the uh, building society and asked to see the manager. Uh, there were no other customers in the building at the time. They were let into the manager's office, and the woman produced a gun from her handbag. Then they took the manager back out of his office and made him tell the cashiers to hand over all the money they had in the tills and in the safe. Uh, it came to about $25,000. Presumably, you have a number of witnesses. Yes, uh, we have a good description of both of them. Uh, the man was about 1 meter 80 centimeters, around 35 years of age, with blue eyes and short, curly, red or ginger hair. He was wearing jeans, a green sweater and a three-quarter length blue coat. When he spoke to the cashier when he came in, he called himself Mr. Erickson, but we doubt whether that is his real name. But we do know that may be his real name. He also spoke with a strong Scottish accent, which may help us to trace him. And what about the woman? Now, she is in her early twenties, slim and quite tall, about 1 metre 70 centimetres. She was wearing a long white raincoat, which was quite loose-fitting, and which she didn't take off. She had a beige handbag, which they used to hide the gun in, She's got straight, shoulder-length blonde hair, blue eyes, and, like the man, has a noticeable accent. Do you have any other information? Yes, the car they used was seen by two or three people. It's a blue or dark blue Ford Escort, and we have the registration number. And it's G595ERI. I'll say that again. It's G595ERI. Now, the car was stolen from Bishopstone just over a week ago, so if anyone has seen it in the last week, we would like to hear from them. 
We also know that the car's front left headlight was broken when it was stolen, and is still broken. We think. So you would like information from the public about the car? Yes, and the people. We're appealing to anyone who thinks they may recognise the two robbers or know anything about the car. We've set up an incident room in Swindon, and the telephone number is double seven four five two nine. So we would like people to ring us if they have any information.、Uh, and of course, all calls will be dealt with in the strictest confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the number again, if you have any information, is double seven four five two nine. And now back to the studio. Seven. And now the results of our survey on spare time activities and sports. We wanted to know how people spend their spare time, so we interviewed women and men around the town during the whole of last week. Here's what we found out. Only forty percent of men interviewed claimed to do some kind of physical exercise, while fifty percent of the women we talked to said that they follow a regular program of exercise. We also talked about watching sport on TV, and both groups claimed to spend some time on this. Forty-one percent of men interviewed do this, and thirty percent of women. We also wanted to find out exactly what form of exercise these people do. So we asked about different sports and activities. Jogging was by far the most popular, with 20% of men and 18% of women. Most of them do this during the week, either in the morning before going to work or in the evening after work. Football was also popular with the men. 13% claimed to play, mainly at the weekend on Saturdays. Not surprisingly, none of the women claimed to play. Cricket was another popular sport among the men, with 19% claiming to play. Again, no women mentioned this sport. A lot of people also said they took some form of exercise other than these team sports. 80% of men and 90% of women said they regularly walked as a form of exercise, either as part of their daily routine to get to work. Or at the weekends in their spare time, athletics was also mentioned, but not by many. Only ten percent of men said they did this. None of the women we spoke to mentioned it at all. Dancing was also mentioned as a form of exercise. Three percent of men and women mentioned this, and also yoga. Five percent of women said they did this regularly, and two percent of men. Finally, a small number of people included gardening as a form of exercise. Eleven percent of men said they did this, and thirteen percent of women. Eight. In earliest times, men considered lightning to be one of the great mysteries of nature. Some ancient people believed that lightning and thunder were the weapons of God. In reality. Lightning is a flow of electricity formed high above the Earth. A single flash of lightning, 1.6 kilometers long, has enough electricity to light one million light bulbs. The American scientist and statesman Benjamin Franklin was the first to show the connection between electricity and lightning in 1752. In the same year. He also built the first lightning rod. This device protects buildings from damage by lightning. Modern science has discovered that one stroke of lightning contains more than 15 million volts. A spark between a cloud and the Earth may be as long as 13 kilometers and travels at a speed of 30 million meters per second. Scientists estimate that there are about 2,000 million flashes of lightning per year. Lightning hits the Empire State Building in New York City 30 to 48 times a year. In the United States alone, it kills an average of one person every day. The safest place to be in case of an electrical storm is in a closed car. 
Outside, one should go to low ground and not under trees. Also, one should stay out of water and away from metal fences. Inside a house, people should avoid opening doorways and windows and not touch wires or metal things. With lightning, it is better to be safe than sorry. Nine. These days, we know a lot about contaminated air, contaminated water, and so on. We know that smoke, chemical substances, and dust particles pollute our environment. We're not so familiar with the concept of pollution from noise, and especially with its psychological effects. Generally, the physical effects are not surprising. Partial or complete deafness can result from excessive noises. Airports, some factories, even some discos. But did you know that it's possible to kill a person with the right or wrong noise? Psychologists now believe that noise has a considerable effect on people's attitudes and behaviour. Experiments have proved that in noisy situations, even temporary ones, people behave more irritably and less cooperatively. In more permanent noisy situations, many people cannot work hard, and they suffer from severe anxiety and instability, as well as other psychological problems. However, psychologists distinguish between sound and noise. Sound is measured physically in decibels. Noise cannot be measured in the same way because it refers to the psychological effect of sound, and its level of intensity depends on the situation. Thus, for passengers at an airport who expect to hear aeroplanes taking off and landing, there may be a lot of sound, but not much noise. That is, they're not bothered by the noise. By contrast, if you're at a concert and two people behind you are whispering, you feel they're talking noisily, even if there is not much sound. You notice the noise because it affects you psychologically. Both sound and noise can have negative effects, but what is important is if the person has control over the sound. People walking down the street with stereo earphones, listening to music that they enjoy, are receiving a lot of decibels of sound. But they're probably happy hearing sounds which they control. On the other hand, people in the street without stereo earphones must tolerate a lot of noise which they have no control over. It is noise pollution that we need to control in order to help people live more happily. Ten. Now, Mr. Wilson, we'd like to ask you a few questions about the robbery you witnessed the Tuesday before last, the fifteenth of September. Oh, but I had an interview with one of your officers the day after. Yes, sir, I'm aware of that. But there are still one or two little details we'd like to get absolutely clear. So, if you don't mind. Oh, not at all. I- I'm glad to help. What would you like to know? Well, sir, first of all, we'd like to know the registration number of the Ford Fiesta. The number you gave us on the sixteenth was Y E A six one O J. Are you absolutely sure that was the correct registration? Gosh, I can't remember the exact registration now. I mean, it was ten days ago. Um. Yes, I do remember thinking that's easy. It almost looks like year, and I'm sure the last letter was J for Jimmy. That's my name, you know. But the numbers, well, I've no idea now, really. You see, Mr. Wilson, we had another witness who told us the numbers were six o one, not six one o. Oh dear. Um. All I can say is, I gave you the numbers that I thought I saw at the time. Okay, Mr. Wilson. Can you go over the events as you remember them? Um. I. Uh. I was on my way home from the chemist's. It was about twenty-five to six. I just bought some cough mixture for my little boy, and. 
How can you be sure about the time? Well, I'd just been to the chemist, as I say, and I remember saying to the girl, "Well, I suppose you must be glad the day's over." And she said, "Oh no, not today. We do normally shut at five thirty, but it's our late night tonight. Unfortunately, we don't shut till a quarter to eight. So another two and a quarter hours to go." So it was five thirty-five. Yes, and just as I was going to cross the road, I saw two men run out of the pub opposite, jump into the red Ford Fiesta, and drive off at top speed. There was a driver already in the car waiting for them, of course. So there were three of them altogether. Yes, and we found out that one of the barmen in the pub was the one who organised it all. He handed the money over to the two blokes who went into the pub. Ah, so you've arrested them all now? All but one, sir. That's why evidence could be crucial.